So question for you. Uh, the question is this. How many of you have ever failed at something? Anybody like me ever failed at something? All right, so here's the second question that goes along with that. Uh, did you plan to fail? Like when you started out, was that your intention? Like, you know, I, when this is done and over with, I'm going to intentionally fail at that. I'm guessing it wasn't. I, um, you know, I, I was looking at this water bottle uh, right before I came out here. I just opened it. And I, I thought, if I, if I were you and I were sitting there and I was looking at that thing, it would drive me nuts the whole time I, I was, that thing leaning like that, like I'm just waiting for it to fall over. Anybody notice that besides me? It's like, drive, can you see it? Does it look straight that way? We'll leave it that way. All right. So somebody says no. All right. Well, I'll hide it over here somehow or something. I don't know. It's driving me nuts. Anyway, somebody failed to make a good water bottle. So here's my point. Uh, I don't know if you're like me, uh, there have been many things that I have failed at, but that was not my intention. I mean, when I started out, it wasn't to fail. Maybe you've seen this statement. It goes like this. People don't plan to fail, they what? They fail to plan. People don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. But it stands to reason that because of a lack of planning, maybe a lack of intentionality, that people fail. They don't achieve their desired goal. So I'll tell you a little story of mine of a, a failed attempt. Uh, Lynette and I had been married a couple years. We just uh, had our first baby. Money was tight. Uh, and, uh, and I thought, you know, there's some things that we need. And at that point, we had avoided credit cards like the plague. And I thought, well, maybe if we just had a credit card, we need to establish some credit. That's what everybody kept telling us. And, and I thought, okay, I'll use that as an excuse. So I finally applied or, you know, responded to one of those mail order things that we got. And I got the first credit card. And I thought, okay, I know I got to be careful with this. So I'll, I'll keep the purchases, you know, real simple. And, you know, so I, you know, $10, 20 And so I did that for the, you know, first month that we had it. And I thought, okay, that shouldn't be too bad. And I remember getting that first bill. And I thought, holy mackerel, how did 10 and $20 purchases add up to be so much? And I thought, man, what was I thinking? But, but anyway, I, I looked at that and I thought, how in the world am I ever going to, to pay for this? And I thought, oh, well, I don't have to pay it off right away. I can take some time and make some monthly payments on it, you know, that little monthly, low monthly payment. Now, it was kind of nice because, you know, when I looked at it, I was like, okay, I've got some things that otherwise we wouldn't, you know, have, and maybe not everything we needed. Maybe there were some things that I wanted on there, but I knew if I hadn't gotten the credit card, we wouldn't have had them. So a couple months go by, and I, I'm like, you know what, this is not working out. Uh, I'm making these payments, but I'm getting nowhere at it. And very quickly, I realized that I was in trouble. Now, did I plan to do that? No. But did I fail to plan to keep that from happening? Absolutely. Did I know it could happen? Yes, I did. I'd heard all the stories, just like everybody else did. And I was determined when I got this one that I wasn't going to let that happen. But I chose not to follow the advice. I, I kind of proved what King Solomon said back in his day when he said this, refuse good advice and watch your plans fail. Take good counsel and watch them succeed. Now, I had mastered the first part of that. So I say this, so maybe we do plan to fail. Uh, at least we set ourselves up for failure because in planning to fail, we're really setting ourselves up to fail and often do. Now, where am I going with all of this this morning? To be honest with you, 
I have no idea. I have no plan. So I guess we're done. No, I'm just kidding. Some of you were already packing up and ready to go. So we've been in this series uh, that we've called The Intentional Year. We've been talking about doing some things that, that we know we want to do. We even know that we need to do them, but we find a hard time. Uh, we, it, you know, we find it hard to find time to do the things that we need to do, such as praying, resting, isn't it amazing that we, we have to be told, we have to be reminded, we have to be intentional about something as simple as resting? We all know we need to do it. Listen, I, of all those on the list, this is the one that I probably fail at the most. Uh, I am horrible at in being intentional about resting. And my wife will often tell me, today is your day off. Do something fun. Go rest. Do, you know, but, but i got to be reminded. So we've talked about praying and resting. We've talked about renewing ourselves, investing in right relationships. Uh, we've talked about finding meaning uh, in the, in, and purpose in the work that we do on a regular basis. Honestly, here's what I want you to think about when it comes to this series. I don't want you to think about plans. I want you to think about rhythms because there's a big difference. Here's what happens. When we set plans, they, plans become goals. And if we accomplish the goal, then we're like, okay, I did what I was supposed to do, check that off my list, and then we start another plan or a different plan or another project or whatever. And we never really learn to, to really put into practice the most important things that, that we need to, the things that we've been talking about. And so I want you to think about rhythms because rhythms help us maintain a very healthy way of life. So we've been in this 21 days of prayer, and uh, we're about halfway through that right now. And, uh, and some of you are like, okay, I can do this for 21 days. And every day you're checking it off and you're counting. I've only got, you know, seven more days to go or whatever. And, and that wasn't the purpose of that, to be honest with you. Uh, the purpose of 21 days of prayer, yeah, it was to seek God intentionally for 21 days. But more than that, we wanted us, all of us, to create this rhythm in our lives that would carry on way past the 21 days. I don't know about you, but I've seen God do some great things already in the middle of this 21 days of prayer for our church, for me personally, some things that God has revealed to me. And I don't want them to stop at the end of this 21 days. I want those patterns to continue. I want to see God show up and work and do the things that, that I'm praying and asking him to do and that he's revealing to me. And so I want this to become a rhythm, not just in my life, but in your life as well. There's a, uh, a passage, a, a, a couple of verses in the New Testament. Matthew records Jesus uh, saying something that I want to show you that kind of speaks to this. I'm going to look at it from the message version, which is really a paraphrase. And by that, if you don't know what that means, Eugene, Eugene Peterson wrote this, uh, this version of the Bible. It wasn't where he sat down and copied it from the original text. He took it and said, if Jesus were alive today, this is how he would have probably said it. And I really like the way he breaks this down. So let's look at this. Jesus speaking, he says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? He says, then come to me and get away with me. I want you to notice some of the things that show up in this as we go through this. But some of the things that we've been talking about through this series, about praying, about getting away with God. He says, get away with me and you'll recover. You'll renew your life. I'll show you how to take a real what? Rest. I don't know about you, but sometimes I need to know exactly what a real rest looks like. Walk with me. And what? Work with me. Mm. Watch how I do it, he says. And then he continues. He says, learn the unforced. Everybody say unforced. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. The things that Jesus taught us to do. Praying and forgiving, all of those things, reading our Bible. It really wasn't meant to be a checklist. It was meant to be a rhythm in our lives that brings health to our well-being. And so he says, learn from me. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you, which is what goals often become, don't they? Oh, I got to get this done. I got to check this off. I committed to this 21 days of prayer, so I got to do it. And, and, and miss the real heart behind that. He says, keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. 
I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm just, I, whenever I, I read this passage in the way that, that Eugene wrote it, I, I'm just drawn to it because I can hear Jesus saying this. Because at the heart of it, if you study, you know, if you just study the four Gospels, you see that this is exactly what Jesus wanted for us, to live freely and lightly. Now, if you've been following along in the book that goes along with this series, uh, you know that we finished the last chapter, or I, at least I'll say the last topic last week. Uh, but there's one more topic of conversation that, that uh, we want to have uh, as it relates to this building these rhythms in our lives. And, and, and I'm just going to say this. This is one rhythm if we fail to do, uh, it, will, it will kill all the other rhythms that we're trying to create. It really will. And, and I think you'll agree as we go through this. So today's topic of conversation is on our finances. Everybody say finances. Now here's what was funny. I knew when that popped up on the screen because as soon as it did, weird things began to happen in the audience. You got real uncomfortable. You know, you started squirming a little bit. And even in your, in your own heart or your own chest or your own mind, things are like, oh, you know, I get that. I understand that. But, but hang on with me. Here's why that happened. Because we know of all the topics that we've talked about. We, we agree with them. We know we need to do something about them in our lives. And, and you know, so, so we're in agreement with that. Uh, but of all the topics that, that we don't like, it's this one because it hits a little too close to home. We know that this is the one that, if we're honest, we have the hardest time in the world creating some healthy rhythms around. And, uh, and Jesus knew this himself, and he understood that. And that's why he spent more time talking about this topic than any other topic that he talked about. Do you realize that? He knew that this was a big issue for us and would be. And so he spent more time talking about this, trying to help us in this area than any other topic that he covered. Jesus said that we cannot serve two masters. You'll love the one and hate the other, or you'll love the, the other and hate the one. And then he said this, you cannot serve both God and money. If we are mastered by our money, we will never find and live in those rhythms of grace. Let me say it again. If we are mastered by our money, instead of mastering our money, we will never live in the rhythms of grace. We will never live freely and lightly the way Jesus intended for us to live. Trust me, I know that from personal experience. That's why I shared that story with you about credit cards. It took me years to get out of the debt that I had created. And it took a very intentional plan and some hard work to get there. So I'm gonna give you this morning a proven rhythm that can help you, uh, that, you that you can follow, and that will allow you to create this rhythm and experience God's grace in your life when it comes to your finances. I wanna lay out a plan that's simple, it's doable, it's nothing that you haven't seen or heard before, and when you see it, you'll be like, okay, and I want to say this, it has nothing to do with how much money you make. I'll say this, you can make a lot or you can make a little, and it's both hard but yet simple to follow this plan, all right? And we make it either. We either make it hard for ourselves or we can make it simple for ourselves. It has nothing to do with how much money we make. So I, 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 I've titled this way, Five Ways to Be Intentional About Mastering Your Money. And here is the five ways. Work steadily, budget intentionally, give purposefully, spend wisely, and save consistently. Now some of you are like, okay, I, we get that. We, we've seen that. You've seen me teach on different forms of this uh, over the years if you've been coming here, all right? This is a biblical plan that God has for our lives, a rhythm that we need to create and live by to live freely and lightly to experience God's rhythm of grace in our lives. And, and so, again, I get that this is nothing new. But if I were to ask you how many of you are actually doing all five of those, I can guarantee you that way less than half of us 
could say that we're doing half of it or, or doing all five of those. Statistically, it's been proven that, that a very small percentage do all five. In fact, a very small percentage only consistently do one or two of those things, that they've created some kind of rhythm in their life as, around it. So if that's the case, the question is, why are we failing when it comes to our finances? Is it because, like King Solomon said, we are ignoring good and proven advice? If that's the case, let me just break these down real quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on any of them this morning, but let's talk about working steadily. How many of you have a job? How many of you work more than one job? Several of you, okay. So, so here's the point. This is the one that we all pretty much have down packed. I mean, we get it. We have to work. If we're going to have the necessities of life, if we're going to have the things that we want above and beyond our necessities, we understand that we have to work. So most of us work. We work hard. We work steadily. We work long hours. Many of us work more than one job, all right? Now, if you missed last week and, and Trey's message, I, I'm not going to break it all down, but, but he gave some great advice for us last week. And, uh, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but I do want to re- remind us of the three key points that, that he made. I know, as I said in the audience last week, I wrote these down because sometimes I need to be reminded of them. But here's what his points were. Be intentional about seeing the blessing in our work. Sometimes I think we miss that. We forget what work really is and what it's about. Be intentional about who we are working for and be intentional about the impact that our work is actually having. Again, sometimes we just need to be reminded of those simple truths in our lives. Uh, Many of us think that work is a curse, and work is not a curse. Work is a part of God's plan for our lives. It was from the very beginning of time. When God put the first man and the first woman in the Garden of Eden, here's what it says in Genesis chapter 2, 15. He says, the Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to what? To work it. Everybody say work it to work it, and to take care of it. So work is part of God's plan for our lives. The work it part, we get. We got it. It's the taking care of it part that that needs some intentionality on our end. So again, work is not a curse. It's a privilege. It's a way of providing for the things that we need. But the breakdown comes when it comes to what we do with what we make from our work. So let's look at number two. Number two on the list is budget intentionally. Now, when people see this, this idea of creating a budget, and I've talked to many of you, I know when I first started and heard about it, I was like, that seems a, a little, you know, I, I don't know, like you're, you're boxing me in and, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to do the things I want to do. And, that, you know, there, there's like, I don't know, like bondage associated with that. But the truth of the matter is there's nothing more freeing in our lives than to live and be intentional about budgeting the money that we have. Experts say that not living with some sort of budget is the second leading cause to financial failure. And I'll tell you what the first one is a little later. I don't know how people do it without a budget. I'll be honest with you. Uh, When I first started dating with Lynette, um, the thing that blew me away was how well she budgeted her money and how she, she knew exactly what she was making. She knew exactly what was going out. She knew what she had to spend on different things, and she stuck to that. And she really helped me discipline myself, create rhythms in my own life. And to this day, uh, we live by a budget. We budget uh, our income from, the, from what comes in to what goes out. A budget, I want you to think of, is like a, a road map. I was thinking about this uh, over the weekend and thinking, you know, if, if, if I decided I want to go from here to, to California, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is what? I'm going to map out a road to get there. Otherwise, I'm just going to take off and, and know that if I head in a certain direction, hopefully I'll end up there. But you know, if I'm just two degrees off of, of that point, not knowing that I can end up in a whole nother country, that's all it takes to, to miss the mark. Now, it seems like pretty, and, and, but, and so I say that, so, so a budget is kind of like a roadmap. It keeps us, you know, on track. It lets us know when we're 
off track, when we're, we're not heading in the direction that we, it warns us of, hey, if you continue going down this way, there's, there's danger impending. So I want you to think of it that way. The Bible's clear about us being good stewards of what we have and gives warnings about what will happen if we're not. For example, it says this. He says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways. And, and, and so really what I, I, this word sluggard is, for those of you who just think that you don't need a budget, and at the end of it, it's morally, mostly because we're just too lazy to sit down and figure out what a budget is and what it looks like. But anyway, so go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, and yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at the harvest. Do you see a rhythm taking place there? Even that little ant that annoys us sometimes has learned to live within God's rhythm of grace and lives lightly and freely because of that. Listen, money will never do us any good if we don't understand how to use it. All right, number three on our list. Give purposefully. Give purposefully. Now, I'm going to skip this one, and if we have time, I'll come back to it at the end. Uh, and, and really, we're going to skip it. Now, some of you are, are like, okay, I can't believe you're going to do that. But listen, don't we do that anyway when it comes to our budget? So I'm just doing what most of us do anyway. When it comes to, to giving, we're like, okay, when I get to the end, if I got any left over, then I'll come back to this and address it. So let's go on to the next one. The next one is spend wisely. Right now, some of you are like, did he really skip over that? Yes, I did. So let's talk about spend wisely. Uh, that's the, the, the fourth part of the fourth thing that we need to do. Let me ask you this. Ever make an unwise purchase? Anybody like me ever make an unwise purchase? Uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll, again, I'll tell you a little story. And I, and I remember this to this day, and I learned a very hard lesson. Uh, again, Lynette and I, this was even before we, we had our first son. We hadn't been married very long. And uh, we lived near a car dealership, and this car dealership got in this Jeep Cherokee that, man, it was stinking awesome. Um, this was before they downsized them. It was one of the bigger, you know, Jeep Cherokees, and it had these big tires, and the tire, the rims matched the, the, the color of the Jeep, and across the hood was this big golden eagle uh, painted on it. It was stinking awesome, but instead of having a golden eagle on the hood, it should have had a golden turkey up there or a golden buzzard because uh, that thing was a piece of junk. Now, when I bought it, I knew that I shouldn't. I, everything in me told me don't do it. But at the same time, everything in me said, wouldn't it be nice? Look at this thing. And, you know, it's price is right. And, you know, and, and, and to be honest with you, I really couldn't afford to buy it. And more importantly, I couldn't afford to drive it. Because every time I turned around, it needed something else done to it. The greatest day of my life was the day that we, I followed a guy to the bank and signed the paperwork over to him. Uh, Lynette followed us there. I told her, I said, when I go into the bank, keep the car running. Uh, because when I sign that paper, I'm running out, we're jumping in the car, and we're taking off. Uh, I was so afraid on the drive to the bank, it was going to break down at any moment. I, I'm telling you. So, uh, so we've, we've all done that, haven't we? We've, we know we, we've spent unwisely. Here's some things to think about when it comes to, to spending. Here's some, just some simple questions that I've learned to ask myself. Number one, why am I buying this? Let's be real. Why am I buying it? Do I need it or do I want it? Do I need it or do I want it? Now, there's nothing wrong with buying something that you want if you can answer the next question correctly. Can I afford it? And then the last question that I often ask, is it the wise thing to do? And that one's usually the one that kicks my butt and keeps me from making some very unwise decisions sometimes. Listen, a budget is only as good as we stick to it, and that's why the Bible gives this advice. Of what use is money in the hand of a fool, since he has no desire to get wisdom? What use is money in our hands if we don't take the time to master our money before it masters us? Next one, last one on the list. Save consistently. Save consistently. 
Now, this seems to be harder to do today maybe than ever before. And one reason is uh, we're just bombarded with the mentality uh, to live for today, to live in the moment, because we don't know what tomorrow is going to to. To bring, And so it's like, why I've stuck all that away? And that's the second thing. It's so hard for us to put money there and just leave it there, especially with all the new shiny, new and improved gadgets that are out there, you know, that are always, man, you need this. You know, you, you, this will improve your life. And, and we all know what those things are. And so it's even hard. So, so maybe I can remember my parents saying to the, this to me as a kid. I'd get a couple dollars, and I couldn't wait for them to take me to the store so I could spend it. And they would always say, that money is what? Burning a hole. Yeah, some of you know, burning a hole in your pocket. And putting money in saving sometimes like, it's like that. It's like, look at all that money I got. Look at what I could get Look what I, without thinking about the long-term consequences of it. The second reason that people don't put money into the bank, first of all, is because they, uh, it's just hard for them to do it. The second is because uh, to put money in there and to leave it there is hard. But the second thing is because, to be honest with you, they don't have any left over at the end of the month to put in there. In fact, statistics tell us that over 40%, over 40%, so if, if, if I were to just take this room and I divide it about right here, Okay, that's a little, little more than half over here and about 40% over here. This many people spend more than they make. And that's why people can't put money in a bank, why they can't save, because they don't have any left over. I remember the first time I took financial peace, and we sat with a couple, and, and we were learning how to do a budget. And, and I remember this couple came back the second week after they'd worked on a budget, and they said, we finally know why we're in so much debt. We're spending way more than what we're bringing in. And I remember them saying to the tune of two and $3,000 every month. Now, they never shared how much debt they were in, but I just thought, it doesn't take long to get really in over your head at that. But they just simply didn't know what was coming in, and they had no idea how much was going out. So I want to give you a little quick reality check this morning. Let's talk about credit cards for a second since I started talking about that. The average credit card debt per household is about 72. Actually, right now, it's about $7,900 uh, per household. And so let's say that, that uh, at that $7,200, uh, you pay a 12% interest on the money that's, that you owe on that. You realize that if you didn't charge anything else on that credit card and just made the monthly payment to pay it off at 12% interest, it would take you 243 months to pay it off. That's 20 years plus three months. 20 years and three months just to pay that off. At the end of that 20, uh, 243 months, it will have cost you $11,850. Now, I, I, don't know, I think we need that sometimes. We need to go, okay, I need a better plan. I know I did. When I began to look at that, it was like, all right, this plan ain't working. And so I needed something different. Now, let's talk about savings for a minute, give you something else to think about. Let's say that you make $20,000 a year. Now, that's on the low probably side for, for a lot of folks. But let's just say uh, for the next 20 years, you're going to make $20,000. You're not going to get a raise. You're not going to get an increase. You're just going to flat make $20,000 a year for the next same amount of time, all right? And let's say that you were to take just 10% of that $20,000 and put it away every month for the next 243 months, all right? Now, you're not earning any interest on it. You're just taking 10% of that and putting it away in savings. At the end of that 243 months, you will have saved $40,000. That's without any interest. That's just taking 10% for the next 20 years of that monthly deal and putting it away. Now, let me show you what if you invest it. So over here, let's say you still take that 20,000 and you take that 10% and you in uh, that you earn 10% also on that 10% that you're putting away over 243 months. At the end of that, you will have saved up and earned 114,500 bucks. Isn't that a better plan? Nobody's shaking their head. All right, so we need a better plan. And again, I just share that with you 
to, to just kind of, the, I think sometimes we need a reality check when it comes to the way that we're spending our money. Listen, you can do this, but you have to, back to our list, work steadily, budget intentionally, give generously, spend wisely, and save consistently. Now, what time is it? All right, guess what? We've got a few minutes left. You know what we're going to do? We're going to go back. Actually, it's give purposefully. Let's talk about that for just a moment. Y'all really didn't think I was going to let you out of here without spending a little bit of time on this one, did you? Now, of all the steps that we've talked about, not many people would disagree with what, what's been said. We all agree. We've seen it. We've known it. We've heard it for years. But this step is the one that makes people squirm the most, makes us feel the most uncomfortable, especially if it's in connection to church. Some of you right now have some really funny things going on uh, with you. If you're watching online, it's you've, it, it, your screen's kind of like, oh, look, I'm losing connection, and you're ready to, to, to disconnect. Don't do that because Tom's watching you, and he knows if you do that right now, so don't do that. So I, I, I want to say this. Relax. I'm not going to ask you to give. Okay, I actually, I am, but stick with me. I think you'll see where this is going. What if I told you of all the rhythm, rhythms that you could, could create in your life that this one comes with the biggest and greatest return? I hope that'll make you listen for just a second. Listen, if you read the scriptures, you'll find out, as I have, that this is one of the most missed opportunities that we all miss out on. And here's why I say that. We know that God should have first place in our lives. If I were to ask you that, if you're a follower of Christ, you know that beyond any, you don't even have to think about it, that God should have first place in our lives. But the one thing that often keeps him from first place, from that first place position in our lives is our finances. And again, I can prove this statistically, but let me show you what scripture says about this. God speaking says this. Honor. Everybody say honor. Honor the Lord with your what? Wealth. Just follow along. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the what? First fruits of your crops. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. The first thing that we're to do with our money is to honor God with it. And the way that we honor God with it, I think, is really by following all five of those principles that we've been talking about this morning, but especially this one, the one that we often put at the end and go, if there's any time, if there's any money left over, then maybe I can give, or you know, we'll see what happens. If you budget, I want to say this. This should be the first or maybe the second line item on your budget. Only second to income, all right? You need to know what's coming in and you need to be intentional. You need to be purposeful about what you're giving. And it should be the first thing because this is the way that we honor God. This is the way we keep God first place in our lives. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crop. And then he says this, if we do this, he says, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, that's Old Testament language, okay? I get that, and you're like, I'm not even sure what all that means. All right, here's what, in today's language, he's saying this. Honor me with the first fruits. Honor me with the first part of your income, and I promise you that all of those things that you're in need of, they're, they're going to be taken care of, Okay? If, 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 we, if you learn to master your money and you honor God, everything else is going to be taken care of. So if we were to look in the New Testament at a passage that kind of speaks to this, this is Jesus himself speaking, and, and it kind of makes more sense to our day and time as far as language goes. For them, they didn't really earn money like we do. And so crops and, and livestock were often the way that they 
you know, that was the way they saw the increase, and they used that, and they would give that, those, those items and, and set those aside, and they would tithe. Them. In the New Testament, Jesus says this, it's a, and I'm not going to read all of it, but if you get the time, look at Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 25 through uh, 34, but Jesus says this. He starts out this passage, do not worry about what you're going to eat, about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about those basic necessities that you need. He says, don't I know that you need them? And he gives these examples, consider the flowers, you know, they don't toil nor reap, think about birds, they, but yet our Heavenly Father takes care of them. And he says, do you not know that I know that you need those things as well? And he finishes the passage and he says this, but seek first, everybody say first, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. Going back to what he said, if you honor God first, if you seek God first, all that's going to be taken care of. All of that, you will have what you need. Too many of us are too worried about, well, if I give to God, I'm not going to have enough to. And God says, no, if you give to me, I promise you, you're going to have enough to get and have what you need. In fact, Jesus, throughout Scripture, makes these promises about this when it comes to our finances. So if I jump back to the Old Testament, and with this we're, we're going to close, so just hang in there. Here's what he says uh, in Malachi chapter 3, the very end of the Old Testament, before he goes radio silence for 400 years, God says this, bring the what? The whole tithe into the storehouses. Not part of it, not what's left over, but set aside that first 10% that's what the tithe is. And bring that whole tithe, honor me with that, God says. And watch what will happen. He continues, verse 10. He says, test me in this. This is the only place and the only thing in Scripture that God says to, that we have permission, and not just permission, but he challenges you and me to put him to the test in. Again, this is the number one topic that he talked about because he knew this would be the number one issue that we would keep him out of first place in our lives. So he says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. So he says, listen, and this is why I say it's a missed opportunity for us, because we don't put God to the test. We don't trust God in this area of our lives. And so we're out there trying to master our money when our money is really mastering us. And it's simply because we're not following good biblical advice on how to create rhythms of grace when it comes to our finances. So I want to end with this. Um, we offer this thing, and, and that, that really this wasn't what this was all about, but I believe it in it so much that that. We created this thing called the 90-Day Tie Challenge. These cards are available in the lobbies at our campuses. You can go online. You can do this online as well. But the 90-Day Tie Challenge is this. We invite you to put God to the test, all right? It's not about us getting your money. That, that's not what this is about. This is about experiencing God's grace, rhythms of grace in your life. So for 90 days, we challenge you to put God to the test. The first thing that you do when you get paid is take 10% of it and set it aside for God and give it to God. And watch what God does with the rest. And we challenge you to do that for 90 days. Now, at the end of 90 days, if God didn't keep his end of the bargain, you can call our finance guy, Jason, and say, okay, I took the 90-day challenge. Now, to do that and to, to, for this to work, you have to fill this out. Jason gets it. It goes on record so that we have, a, you know, we have to know that you actually did do it and you gave something. You just can't say, hey, man, I gave $2,000 a week and it didn't happen, so I need my money back. All right? So it does, we, we have to have a record of that. All right? So I, I hope that's a given. But, but at the end of that 90 days, if you don't feel like God lived up to his end of the deal, you simply call Jason and say, I took the 90-day uh, challenge, it didn't work, I want my money back. No questions asked, Jason will refund your money. Now again, this isn't about giving money to the church. I want you, we want you to experience God's rhythm of grace in your life, and especially when it comes to your finances. I can tell you, when I put God first in my life in this area, everything began to change. 
That was when I began to get out of the debt that I was in. And there, were, there were months where I looked at it and said, I, there's, you know, on paper, this isn't going to work. At the end of the month, I don't have enough to cover all the bills. And yet when we would honor God, I can't always explain it, but somehow it always worked. And every time now when I'm tempted to go, you know what, I got some big bills. Like this month, I got hit with a truck bill that was a, a thousand repair. That was a thousand dollars. Septic tank needed to be cleaned out. The air conditioner, the monthly yearly uh, maintenance deal came up on that. And so this month, I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll just hold off in giving to God this month, and I'll make it up next month, which I probably wouldn't do. And I thought, no, I know better than that. If I honor God with the first part of my income, God promise me, promises me that he'll take care of the rest. And he is, and he does, consistently. And so, again, I hope that you will, you will, you will take good advice, not from me, but from the Scriptures, and apply them to your lives. Would you stand with me this morning as we close in prayer? Fathers, we wrap up this series. Lord, we've talked about being intentional about a lot of things, about praying, Lord, about resting. Lord, resting is a matter of trusting you. Often we don't rest because we're afraid there's, things won't get done. I know that's true in my life. But rest, really, the way you established it was about trusting you, that everything's going to be all right. You got it. And, Lord, nothing is more true of that than when it comes to our finances. And so, Father, I just pray, God, that... <sighs> Lord, that we would all take the challenge. We'd put you to the test. And God, I know how you showed up in huge ways in my life, and you consistently do that when I honor you first. And Lord, I thank you for being that kind of God. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give others the courage, Lord, to do the same thing. And Lord, that they would watch you do what only you can do, Lord, most importantly, that they would see you keep your promise in their life. And, Lord, I just thank you. Thank you for what you'll do. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We pray all of this in Christ's name, and we all agree together and said, amen. amen. Don't forget to make your invite this week, and uh, let's fill this place up with visitors next week. God bless you. Have a great day.